welcome to the Vocal Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Martin Thomas. Join me and my guest speakers as they discuss the journey they've had with their own voice, as well as light bulb moments, stories, and personal wisdoms. Vocal Freedom is a bi weekly podcast raising awareness about vocal health and well being from members of the voice community. Okay, so my guest this week, Claire Cordeau, who is the CEO of BAPAM, the British Association of Performing Arts Medicine, a specialist healthcare charity that's been caring for artists and creators since 1984. They provide free clinical services, expert training and essential resources to individuals and groups of professional singers, instrumentalists and those still in training. They help educate and inform about issues that affect many professional working musicians like stress, mental health issues, managing performance anxiety, hearing and voice disorders and even signpost resources for financial and practical support. I've invited Claire to share her experience with the mission of BAPAM as well as hearing about how her journey into this work began. So welcome to the podcast Claire. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm really pleased to have you. To inform our listeners a bit more about this charity and how it helps people and your role in it, how that came about. Yeah, so, well, the char- as, as you very, very well described, the charity is all about looking after the health of performing artists and looking at very much at those specific issues which really um, stop people from performing or, or practicing, recording, whatever, whatever they're doing. Um, and because, I mean, actually, the number of performing artists is quite small. I know we all know each other and it seems like lots of us, but actually, when you look at all the statistics, there's probably 200, 300,000 in the country. So the chances of you being able to go to your GP and they go, ah, an opera singer, I know exactly what to do for you, are quite slim because Mm. they're not going to see many people in their career. So we specialise in looking after those needs and we're very, very lucky to be funded by some key organisations in the industry, including Help Musicians, Musicians Union, PRS Members Fund, PPL, um, Equity that kind of group who recognize the health needs of the people they work with and want them to get specialist uh, support in order that they can get back to performing as soon as possible and so because we see lots of patients right across the country so we we operate UK wide then we also learn quite a lot about what they could have done to stop getting sick in the first place, stop having problems. So we do quite a lot of training on health education, um, trying to get people to think about their health before they have a problem so that they can stop having a problem, Um, but also rehabilitation work as well. So, yeah, I'm really lucky to work there. It's a fascinating um, project. Have you been involved in this for a long time? You know, how, how did your journey take you to this to this role? Yeah, well, I've, um, I've I've been there for three years, so so not that long, really, in the history of the organisation. And my background has always been um, health and social care, um, working in the east of England, but I've also done jobs right across the country as, as well. And so when I saw the advert, I'm also a musician, when I saw the advert for this job, I thought, ah, oh, this seems to combine the thing that I spend most of my time doing when I'm not working with the thing that, that I work on. I, I wondered if I'm in with a chance. And so I applied and, and was lucky enough to get the job. That's fantastic. So the, you know, the day to day workings of this, obviously, at the moment with coronavirus and lockdown, have you seen an influx of people needing extra services? Yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of really changed since lockdown, as you can imagine. Um, I mean, normally just the day to day operations is the phone goes, you know, we've got a a team of people who are operating a helpline. Um, If somebody needs an appointment, we schedule them in, we book in the clinicians, we organise the clinics and make sure they know where they're going next stop and they've got the money to do it and all the rest of it. Overnight, we then had to flip over to remote working as everybody's had to. Mm. And we were able to do, luckily, we were able to do that quite quickly. But actually, I I was just doing a comparison of the sort of case mix of the last six months compared to the same six months last year. Oh, yeah. Um, And about, I mean, the thing that's really changed is 
and lots of people would come to us with musculoskeletal issues, you know, in physical injuries, shoulder from violin playing, or you know, all that, all that sort of thing. Yeah. And because they're practicing and playing all the time, but um, now it's it's less to do that. Some of them are, are overplaying, but sometimes it's sports related injuries. People are at their computers all the time. Yeah, all all of that kind of thing. Mental health issues, which were fifteen percent of our overall work last year and now over 26 percent yeah that's... um so very big increase there and um i think we were all expecting that it's devastating yeah um what's going on and vocal health probably about the same as it tends to be around the same level as as mental health um but of course all the voice clinics have been closed mm. Um, so we've ended up um, working with our vocal BAPAM vocal rehabilitation coaches to offer some interim sessions while people are waiting for, for diagnostic assessments to work out what's going on. So, yeah, it has changed quite significantly and all of our appointments are online. But luckily, a number of our clinical partners are also doing face to face work now. So if people need ongoing treatment, then then they're able to go there. That's great. And so you've mentioned that your background as a as a musician. So why don't you tell us a bit about about you and how you how how you ended up doing some music stuff? Because I've not I've seen pictures of you playing different types of guitar, bass, and lead, and and yeah. acoustic, and you know, and we we were once sort of shared a stage, kind of, didn't we, many years ago? We did, oh, yeah. It was a fundraiser, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember it was absolutely pouring with rain, wasn't it? Yeah, I think we um, were supposed to be in this big lorry set up outside, and by the time we got there, it was. Yeah, everyone's going to play inside. You might have been playing That's when right. we got there, I think. Were you on... Oh, possibly. Yeah, yes, maybe. yeah I mean, We were certainly on the lorry playing in the rain. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so right. how, how, did you, how did you start with uh, your yeah. relationship with music? Well, I've, I mean, I've always been in, involved in music in some, some way, shape or form, whether it's singing in choirs or playing piano and, and started off being a bit of a, bit of a folky, really, um, sort of making a bit of extra cash when I was at um, college through playing in, in bars and restaurants and that sort of thing. Lovely. Um, and I'm, I'm quite old. So um, by the time I left university, I went to London and it was kind of, it was sort of early to mid eighties and um, folky kind of acoustic singer songwritery stuff wasn't really it. So I uh, learned to play the bass guitar and joined an indie guitar band. Nice. Um, <laughs> and that was good fun I really enjoyed that and then um uh came back to Suffolk and there was a Kaylee band looking for a bass player so I thought oh yes I could do that and that was great because I'd always loved Celtic music yeah. um and um so did did that for a while and really that's I've you know I've played bass in a in a few with a few bands as you do but um um, my main thing is now with a, a Celtic band and we play a lot of festivals and that kind of thing. So I, pl I play guitar in that now and, and sing. Fantastic. And is this your, is this, um, you know, covers of that kind of music or are you writing your own material? We write, we write yeah. a lot of our own music. We do some traditional stuff, but we use the format of the, the traditional tunes, the sort of dances and mm. um, which is actually really great to play about with um and improvise too yeah um and we i mean we call it celtic psychedelic folk fusion oh nice a a mouthful. <laughs> i'll tell you why we call it that yes, was please. because we were we were doing um we were doing a, a primary school um fate or something in cambridge and it just happened to be um one of the one of the kids that went there his dad was the manager of muse and he said you are <laughs> psychedelic <laughs> celtic <laughs> folk fusion I went, okay then well we'll 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 take that but basically we use a lot of effects so i use a lot of effects on my voice the fiddle player loses, loses loads of effects so, i mean basically we all use effects um and try and give it a bit of a, a sort of worldy reggae upbeat groove yeah. underneath the traditional tunes and it that, that's really fun to play about with yeah the band's called artwork double a 
and um yeah we're online artwork.co.uk and okay. facebook and various different places we've just we released an album in in lockdown you know all planned as it is everyone did mm-hmm. to do it nicely the nice kind of get together and all the rest of it but we're very lucky there's um radio mothership which runs jan paulsford runs that she was a co-writer with cindy lauper and she does a lot of um, well, she runs this radio station pretty much 24-7. Wow. Um, and she offered to give us 24 hours of that we could use for the album launch. And she's got a, a sort of international following for the for the for the station. So um <laughs> we uh, got all the band members to choose all of the work they'd ever done, including the guitar bands and you know, classical music and all the rest of it. So we had 24 hours of us as the band oh. and all the work we done and then all the work they done and had a big chat online it was really exciting actually oh, that sounds amazing it felt it felt like you know you know in the first lockdown when it was you know you didn't see anybody you just went out for your walk mm. um at five o'clock or one after work um and it did feel you went away feeling like I've got energy from these people it's yeah. felt like an actual get together this is the kind of thing I feel when I go to a gig and I meet lots of people and it's really lovely yeah. and it, it it did really feel like that it was lovely that's what we're all missing I think at the moment is that that interaction yeah. and um, I, have, I haven't um been out to see anything live since February um so it's long time, it's it? becoming yeah. you know it's like missing a, a limb a little bit at the moment. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I hope. Yeah, I hope no, we were very changed. lucky. We got to manage to play at Snape. Oh, yeah. Um, who put on some stuff and we just sort of snuck in there <laughs> in between. Has Bapam got any events or sessions coming up that might be useful for us? Musos feeling a bit lost from missing going out to work. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, our training. Um, yeah. For example, basically every month we run a session on keeping mentally well, Uh another session on vocal health and another session on injury prevention. They're two hours each. They're all free. And it's with one of our experts. So I don't, the people listening to this might be particularly interested in the vocal health one. We're really lucky and they'll actually they're very, very popular. We get lots of people coming to those. So those are all available and it's the idea is to give you some background on vocal health and sort of signs and symptoms, what to Mm. do, how to keep yourself well. Lots of us don't, didn't, (laughs) I know, but much more now than I did. And we've also got a community drop in because one of the things we thought is, um, yeah, it's all very well to do two hours on what you should do. (laughs) But we all know that with health, knowing what you should do and actually doing it are yeah, two rather two different, different things, things. So, so we've got a healthy practice diary which anybody can download from our website and then we've got the um, community drop-in and the idea of that is that people can just drop in um, it's on a Tuesday afternoon um, at three o'clock and you can use the healthy practice diary as you wish but um the aim is to try and set some health goals and try and use that group to support you to keep to them. Um, And it's run by an amazing uh, GP who herself is a a singer and a viola player and um, also a a breathing expert. Um, And so she facilitates them, but we also bring in lots of um, practitioners who come and do a guided session so if you would think if your goal was you know I'm going to develop a mental practice for myself somebody might come in and do a session on meditation and you go oh yeah I could do that or or you might not like that but it 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 would be you know lots of ways of trying things trying some things out which might help you and that goes on for about 13 weeks then we'll have a break and then we'll run another one so the idea is you can get some good information and then on a weekly basis you can try and try and keep get up to speed with it and it's all on our website under training and events and you just it's all you just sign up via eventbrite it's all free fantastic Um, and we'd love to see you you don't have to be sick but if you do have a health problem that's really affecting your performance then you know people can just give us a call out to a 7404 and one of our team will have a chat and work out who you should see so we really encourage people to do that and uh, you know it's such a difficult time I know the people 
on our first community drop-in that we ran over the summer, there were people who, who said, you know, they were almost paralysed with what, you know, this is my identity. It's not just I haven't got any money, which is obviously a real concern, and it kind of got left out of government schemes and yeah. all of that. But also, you know, you lose your identity mm. it, because, you know, performance is very often a calling. It's not just something we do to go to work and then come home again. It's 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 part of who you are. And if you can't do it or there doesn't appear to be any purpose for doing it, because, I mean, you can practice in your living room. But who's who's going to hear you can't have that interaction with the audience some people not really getting on that well with sort of live streaming and and that Mm. kind of thing and feeling that the whole connection with their audience was almost a sort of sacramental kind of thing and how how do you make that happen Mm. um so and then losing motivation to do anything because what's the point so really it's sort of devastating and and I think I hope for some people we were able to help with that and and for some people obviously that develops into uh, a mental health problem that it's quite useful to get some one-to-one support with yeah I'm sure that sounds like a a fantastic um, facility that you had over the summer and then the community drop-in if you I mean if you imagine that you're even if you're a lone musician who is normally used to going to work and sitting in with an orchestra every day and that's been cut off and mm-hmm. you know you you just live alone with you and your cat and you haven't got you know that that com- that sense of community and staying in a group and supporting each other must have been such a lifeline yeah you know, no I, really, I think really that's helpful. right and and also if you if you write and perform as a group that's much harder i know everyone sort of tried things with jam kazam and you know zoom choirs and yeah. all of those sorts of things but they're not quite the same are they no it's definitely not the same as as playing live music in in a room with mm-hmm. other people um yeah and you know some things have carried on and they put screens up on strictly and things haven't they so that people can carry on and keep it as socially distanced as possible to uh, to do it again and i know i do know people that managed to go out to the theater socially spaced um distanced uh in that brief period but before we lock down again um, but but they came out saying it was, you know, a couple of people have said to me it was really uncomfortable, sat with a mask on my face the whole time. And it was mm. very, um, although it was beautiful to hear music again, it wasn't the same atmosphere because you felt very on guard all the time about, you know, what's going on and is it safe? And Yeah, yeah so we've been doing a bit of work also about kind of risk assessments because obviously most most people are freelancers and yeah. so and it's the job of the employer to sort out the risk assessment for you to go back to work safely but what if you're not the mm. employee what if you're the person that goes in you know for that recording that day and then some another day you're going to perform somewhere else who looks after you yeah um and so uh, we were very lucky to work with um one of our doctors who um, did a risk assessment that you just a little thickness that you can use and so you could say I am very you know severe or medium or whatever and it takes into account um, the um, your own personal characteristics and gives you a score on that but you don't have to tell people what your characteristics are oh. but it also looks at the activity you're going to do the instrument you play where the, where you're going to play it so if you're playing the keyboard on your own at home pretty low risk but if you're playing a keyboard that's going to be shared with somebody higher risk if you're playing um if you're teaching somebody what does that mean so you could start Mm. to kind of pick up the levels of risk uh because it's quite complex isn't it it's very obviously there's been all all the aerosol stuff which has been um difficult hasn't it going back to you for a moment claire you use your voice now in such an important way in the work that you do in helping people was that a calling for you yeah, I think I always, yeah, I always wanted to do that. I started off as a, a youth and community worker in London and then I'd, I'd been born in Suffolk um, before and, and came back. I suppose my kids were, you know, primary school age and uh, worked for social services in Suffolk and then went across to the NHS and, you know, kind of play different roles in, in that kind of area. And, yeah, I think obviously you use your voice in communication with the people that you're working with and then I suppose as I got 
more experienced and more senior, then you started to need to use it to give messages and stand up and make yeah. speeches and um, and try and persuade people to do things they probably didn't want to do <laughs> um, and um, to, you know, generally improve the service. So I, that, that, I mean, I ha- wasn't, I wasn't as conscious as I could have been about the learning of how to use your voice in that context, but you certainly learn a lot from having to get up in front of a large group of people and, you know, talk your talk your talk and yeah. tell them how to do a new thing and how to engage them and they're, they're all very different. I worked um, for about nine years. I worked in for a company in Scotland. Actually, I left the NHS because we developed a software device that helped plan healthcare. So you had it in the right place at the right time. And it was licensed to a company in Glasgow. Um, so I ended up working for them and then um, that was using maths, which I'm not very good at, but uh, luckily this tool was, <laughs> was very good at it. <laughs> and I could say it needs to do that. Yeah. And, uh, just press the buttons and <laughs> hopefully the right answer will come out. But I sort of understood that, how to use it. And I was able to work with these very clever software engineers who knew how to make it work. Wow. Um, that sounds really and so up. I ended up going all over the world, actually talking about that. So that was interesting. So that's that, is that something that's still used now? This is. What's like I think a, so. Yes. Yes. It, I don't know if it's does, used as as much. I was just going to say, how does it work? What does he do? You you, like a symptom sort of thing. Or? So well, no, it's more about um, being able to put in your population. Oh yeah. So you know, let's say Essex, and say right, the population is this this is this size and it's made up of a certain amount of older people a certain amount of younger people and they all have um all have a chance of becoming sick from something okay or other and if you're older you're more you know you're likely to have lots of different things and if you're younger you might have one thing from time to time and obviously that all has a knock-on effect in the number of people who go to the gp and then the number of people that the gp refers to the hospital the number of people that end up having an inpatient episode and the number of people that end up coming out the other end and needing care and so it enabled you to sort of model that whole journey of how people living their daily lives in the population might interact with the health service and so therefore if you had an older population um, or you know a, a, a certain you know a flu um, epidemic or you, you could then run those scenarios in that virtual environment and test out how many how many beds you might need, for example, oh. or how many doctors you might need, or how many devices you might need, how many ultrasounds you need. So you could help plan it rather than go, oh, I think it might be this amount. But go, yeah, oh, that whoops. makes complete sense, doesn't it? So it's so, a way yeah, of that's measuring. What it's about. That's incredible. That's an incredible thing. That's what, presumably how they're still working out the statistics now of of how many yeah, ventilators well, I was, we I was might talking need. to my colleagues yeah. and they, uh, you're saying how you know they're and um saying how did you you know how's it all going and they said well actually we've got a lot of work from the health service at the moment because we're helping plan beds yeah yeah that makes sense doesn't it so you know, those you you need it, it, healthcare is so complex there are so many interactions and we're all individuals and we all behave differently mm. um so the illness might happen in a particular way and that's got its own complexities, but then people behave differently and then um, there are different sorts of resources. So putting all this too much to have in your head, you, you need, yeah. I think, a computer tool just to hold all of those different variables and try and yes. make sense of them. That's amazing. Goodness me. So you've you've been you've been in all these different sectors, but the the, the cr- about, yeah. yeah the crux of it is <laughs> is it's um you know it's it's about helping people and and you know that's that's a great calling to have. And I've been very lucky in the jobs I've had, I must say. Yeah. So is there anything you've learned now, looking back, that if you could go back and tell your younger self, if, is, was there any any advice you might give yourself? Oh, what a good question, and what a difficult <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> I think I mean there's something about and I don't know how you can how you can retrospectively do this but there is something about getting older and wiser that makes you a bit less panicked about you know when you first come across a situation 
that looks like, you know, if you make the wrong decision, it's all going to go horribly wrong and lots of people are going to be potentially hurt and all the rest of it. And then you do it and you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, that went okay. By the time you've done that a few times, you think, oh, no, actually, they have a process for this. It's okay. We manage risks. There are risks. Of course, there are risks in any of these things. But you sort of learn ways of managing it and also learn ways of managing it emotionally I guess so you can try take your own panic out of it and just think logically and work with a team and get advice and all that sort of thing I suppose if I'd said to if I said to my younger self don't worry ask people yeah um, do it as a team it doesn't make you look silly there's no such thing as a as as a stupid question we're all trying to solve a problem that might be the the lesson I'd I'd try and get across but it's difficult without the experience. You do learn those things over a period of time, don't you? Yeah, definitely. It definitely comes through experience, I think. Also, as you get older, you kind of get better at prioritising what you need to worry about. Yeah. You suddenly realise, I actually haven't got the energy to worry about at all. <laughs> yes. There is I that need too. to choose my worries. <laughs> yes, yeah, choose wisely. And just, you know, don't worry about the, the small battles. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah, really try and keep cool. focus. Try and get focus on what what you're what you're trying to do. Yeah, definitely. So voices that might inspire you. This, I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily music, but are there any sort of great speakers or actors or musicians or people that, that resonate with you with their message that you might want to talk about? Well, so I've been thinking about this. So when I was thinking about singers, really, um, particularly female singers, who the ones that came to mind. So if I just think back on the people that have perhaps had the biggest influence and who I will still listen to and still take stuff from, I'd probably go for Joni Mitchell um, as a first, Sinead O'Connor for the raw passion. Yeah. Um, and Angelique Kidjo, uh, oh, I, I love. Know. Do you know, she's... Um, an African singer, um, fantastic, fantastic energy. Sinead O'Connor and Joni Mitchell. You did not surprise me when you said Joni Mitchell. I thought I was thinking when you were saying that you were out there singing with your guitar in the early early eighties, eight nineties. I was thinking Joni, Joni Mitchell. Mitchell. <laughs> it's got to be Joni Mitchell. And uh, and actually, Joni Joni's name comes up a lot. I think people do find her lyrics and her poetry and her the way that she tells stories, and it's so very human. It's so very relatable um yeah it, absolutely. And, and it's ageless completely ageless in terms it's of, interesting yeah. isn't it yeah yeah across the generations people will still talk about Joni yeah I'm after, so what's your favorite Joni song Claire oh little green oh and what about Sinead I don't know man, much of Sinead's material actually also I, I, she only dropped into my radar once um Actually, Mandika came out first, didn't it? And then she did the cover of the Prince song. Yes, I mean, I remember that song. I just really remember because my son was born that year, and I remember it being on the on the radio by the bed as through my sleepless nights. Yeah, nothing compares <laughs> to you. Nothing compares yeah. to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Stopping away. Um, yeah. But I tell you what I've been re- listening to recently um, is she's done uh, the most fantastic version of She Moved Through the Fair. Ah. Um, which is just, yeah, it's, it's spellbinding. I think there's a small amount of backing behind her, but it's really not much. Yeah. I think it, there was a live version that she did at a Van Morrison concert. Um, she's done lots of other amazing things but it's the quality of her voice that I love it's got all that um it, it's got it's got the grace notes and the lilt of I, Irish tunes but she but it's actually she sings it quite straight but she just has that raw passion mm. in her delivery which is you know you can't, you can't not listen that's the thing. And I, that, that, I think that's very much what I would say. I must go. I'm going to go and watch that live performance. I'll find it after we finish. But what I remember um, really feeling and how, why she sort of was a bit of a wow when she came out was because there was a real person who seemed very present and who was giving a performance as opposed to what was mm. that else was in the charts at that time was, you know, just dancey. So you know that stock yeah. and water stuff. Real, wasn't it? Yes, Every, absolutely. everything sounded yeah. the same. Everything had the same kind of harmonies and the same yes. kind of drum beat and the same kind of keys. And and here came an here came an artist. 
and these these are yeah. artists that you that you admire which is yes much better who, 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 can i ask you yeah, who your course. favorite um i mean in terms of songwriting and tuning into i i mean i i do love Joni as well i love the indigo girls who i follow oh, yeah. since the 90s and that was i had a gay friend at college when i was at drama school who trained in new york and she put this album on i was over at her bed sitting in like seven kings or somewhere and um i went who is it who is this and it was their first album that had come out a couple of years before and i was just hooked because these songs meant something these songs were telling mm. stories and they had you know, activism running through them. And there was a message and it was like an important message, whether it be gay rights or women's rights or whatever it was. And I was like, I love music that does that. I love music that has yeah. more to it than just mm. something fun to dance to. I love that stuff too. Um, yeah. But I, I, I do love meaningful music, meaningful lyrics, meaningful mm. storytelling. Um, and then watching real artists deliver that so that you are just pulled in and you yeah. are just, you yeah. forget where you are and who you're with. And and they just hold you in the palm of their hand. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the Indigo Girls. Who else do I like? I love kind of I kind of love everyone. But I think that's I think that's the thing. It's if if a performance, no matter who it is, if it's truthful, if you feel like they're mm-hmm. not they're not BSing the audience and they're not BSing themselves, they're mm-hmm. in they're in the moment and they're real. Uh, then I, I love that. Yeah. No, I was thinking about I was thinking about all your insightful questions that. Um, <laughs> you were suggesting and and actually what was most important to me and I think it is it is that I can admire stylistic cleverness in in vocals but actually at the end of the day it's usually authenticity um that gets it even if it's a little bit out of tune oh completely um, yeah and a little bit you know hoarse or whatever if it's if it's delivered with with meaning and it's heartfelt and it's sincere and it's genuine, um, it speaks to you, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's 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 what I'm talking about. Absolutely. It's and I mean the stylistic stuff can be, you know, vocal acrobatics, amazing. But if they're not switched on, if there's something kind of dead behind the eyes because they're all mm. focused in on technique, it's not going to get me. It's not going to pull the heartstrings at all, is it? So. There's a lot, you know, it's, it's when you get an artist that can be authentic and do the acrobatics. Wow. Right, there you go. That's, that's, you, that's, you've got it. That's yeah. the thing. That's the thing. But that's what people, you know, that's what I would strive for my students to do. But all, always bring it back to being truthful with what it is that you're communicating mm. and, and express it in a, as, in a natural way as you can when you're, yeah. on, when you're on a high C. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> what you're doing up there love uh yeah so <laughs> so light bulb moments in your vast career in working with people what do you think people need more than anything else so much of it is just being listened to and heard and acknowledged and what's great about my current job is I've actually got time to do that and the team has time to do that we don't go we've got five minutes on the phone call we need to get the information send you off we can actually spend a bit of time hearing people and then um the appointments that we have i mean the minimum amount of time somebody would have would be half an hour so you've got properly time and i think that goes really a long way obviously we want to get to the bottom of what's going on uh, and all the rest of it but being heard and being listened to especially when you've perhaps been dismissed for a long time um i think is really powerful and i think that is also true personally for uh, a performance if if somebody comes up to you and um you think oh yeah they've actually listened to that they got what it was about and um and you felt heard in in all of the what you're trying to express from your music that is also the most extraordinary feeling and it didn't matter that they didn't dance or or whatever yeah. but they that sort of you get that kind of engagement so i, I think that that is a, a really important thing i suppose one of the other important things that i i'd have to say and i come back to this so often actually when i trained as a youth worker I was very lucky to have a community worker who was a Buddhist and he was very helpful in sort of enabling me to disentangle some of the complexities you get into when things don't quite go as you want them to, which 
often they don't. And he said, look, you know, do you understand the concept of the ego? Um, he just said, look, you're, you're a youth worker, you're a community worker, your job is to support people to realize, you know, to, to be in the community just because you want them to do something doesn't mean to say that's the right thing for them. And even if it is the right thing for them, if they don't want to do it, you've just got to put up with that. <laughs> and maybe one day they will. Just So what's getting in the way is you, for lots of good reasons, but for you wanting this yourself. And that is just totally irrelevant, totally yeah. irrelevant to what, what's going on. Just take your ego, put it away. Yeah. And then get on with your job. And I have come back to that so often because so often when you get upset about things in your work or your personal life or in music, or that, it, actually it's about I feel hurt or I wanted to do or I and you go, no, just take it away. Yeah. And then think about well, what 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 was the purpose? What were we trying to achieve here and what's gone wrong with that? And what do we need to address? And let's just get on with that. And it it has so helped me in just just dealing with life, I think. Absolutely. It's like the big picture truth, isn't it? And getting out yeah, of your, it's, getting out of yeah. your own way when you can't control everything. Um seeing the yeah. big, seeing the bigger picture. And and you being able to control things actually doesn't usually help solve the problem at all. No. In fact, it's probably making it worse. And it's certainly stopping you seeing what the real problem is. Absolutely. That's fantastic advice. Really good insight there. So what does your voice mean to you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, you know, that was one of the things that worried me about coming on was that <laughs> you, you talked to some amazing singers and I'm thinking, oh, I'm actually not that. Um, so, um, I mean, I think if I'm able to transfer the, the message that I'm trying to convey, hopefully if I can be coherent about that message in the first place, but if I can convey that message and perhaps the emotion that is underneath that, whether that's musically, whether it's in a, in a conversation, whether it's in, you know, giving a presentation, uh, that's probably the most valuable thing. And I should think much more about the techniques that are available to me that I now understand so much more about because I work with these amazing people. Um, to be able to do that mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah I I probably try and focus on the on the feeling yes. um, of it and and hope and hope that the body will follow that do you know what though that's really really good because it's when I well certainly when I find where I work with singers I have to get them to think more like that first because they worry too much about the technical side first and if they're focusing so much on the technique they're almost forgetting what it is they're communicating right so mm -hmm. then we're not getting some sort of natural help and the natural help would be the purpose and the intention behind what it is you're communicating so so much of that will happen within nature when we get excited the voice will go all the way up there by itself it is easy <laughs> you know we see a big bag yeah. of puppies and we can't help but reach the high notes whatever it is that sets you off there's so many things we can do primarily through that relationship with emotion that it's easier to do so that's a great place to be coming from if you're you, you... So if i just had a bit of technique as well it would all go well <laughs> well technique i think you know what technique isn't is technique is everything but it's nothing at the same time because it's we we are we are our habits and building technique is building new habits or building more efficient habits but mm. you've got your habits your voice works it works for what you want it to do so you've got techniques I mean, yes. What's to say that, you know, I yeah. just, um, I, I kind of attempt to do that, but I, I help myself out with um, TC Helicon and lots of echoes and delay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, anyway, though, right? I mean, hilarious. It's just very it. good fun. Yeah, very good fun. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, um, a, a big purple pedal box at one point and played around with that a little bit with my band, but they didn't like it, so uh, I had to stop that. But there was one verse. Oh. Yeah, there was one verse on a Muse track. We used to do the Muse cover of "Feeling Good." The, the, I mean, I love the Nina Simone version, but no, they mm -hmm. want to do the Muse version because they've got rock guitars. Great, uh, and. Um, there was one verse where the um, 
the original act sung almost through a megaphone filter. You know, when you get that sort of megaphone oh, yeah, 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 sound. Yeah. And there was a megaphone pedal. So I was like, right, I'm gonna do, when I get to that verse, I'm going to do that. But for some reason, I don't even know why, it always really reduced the volume. So the sound engineer hated me whenever I did it because he had to crank oh, yeah. everything up because the, the levels just were, would really change when I go on to that effect. So it was just too much hassle. Yeah, that's a real problem, isn't it? Yeah. I've, I've, I've used lots of different pedals and stacks and all sorts of I bet you will know loads yeah. more about this than I do. Go on. <laughs> I don't know. I just know what I've tried. And, yeah, that always I could, I could see them go, oh, I need to turn it up. Oh, yeah. no, I need to turn it down. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I wanted to get wet and dry stuff. And I go, no, just I don't just sound as it sounds. That's why we've got the technique. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always quite work, does it? Because you do um, need, obviously, to have a consistency of sound and if you suddenly get a drop, I did use a booster at one point as oh, yeah. well. So yeah. I could just stamp on that and <laughs> get it to come through. And then I'd forget to stamp it, you know, unstamp it. And so then it would be. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, yeah I, I do admire people who have got really slick pedal technique oh. because it's I think it's a lot to think about in the moment. It certainly is. I'm glad. I, yeah, I'm glad, I'm t- glad they talked me out of it. Actually, when I gave up trying to use it, I think I could focus more more on what I was doing rather than worrying about what I needed to do with my feet. <laughs> but it's, yes, um, no, it's, it's it is fun, distracting, though. isn't it? Absolutely. I think I'll just ask you one last question, really, which is what what is vocal freedom to you? It's a bit about, you know, that sort of um, authenticity. But when when the kind of the sound and the emotion are coming together and you can feel it coming together at that moment, um, you know, you know, that moment when you're playing live and everything suddenly becomes much more than the sum of its parts and you feel yourself floating off, you know, into the sound with everybody else in the band and you don't know where you stop and they start. And you've got your voice in that mix. Mm. For me, that's, you know, musically speaking, that's the point. And, and that's the point where you probably have got your technique and your emotions all moving together. Um, th- those moments, those moments are great. Yeah, that's fantastic. A great, great, um, great way of describing that. And for any of your vocalists who are struggling at the moment and have got a vocal health problem, they've been to their doctors and they say, "We, well, we'll refer you to the ENT, mm. um, but um, it might be, you know, a year before they see you. Yeah. Um, that the minute we raise this with the Royal Society of Musicians and also help musicians, if they, people come to us, then they might be able to fund um, uh, access to private diagnostics just oh, to find amazing. out what's going on. So, you know, sometimes that just rules out anything. Yes. Yeah, which um, can just help. And then they sort out the, the treatment path you, pathway for you. So, you know, so I think a lot of people have a problem and then they're trying to they work through various solutions without getting the diagnostic when it'd be a lot quicker to get the right diagnostic absolutely, um, and then find out that actually it's, you know, muscular tension. So you need physio or you, you know, whatever yeah. it's caused by anxiety. So you can go in a lot because the voice is so complex. You can go in a lot of, in a lot of wrong directions. So please do say to people you come across, if they've got a problem, don't hesitate to phone. We can try and fast track people in. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Claire. That's that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you ever so much for your time Thank tonight, you. Claire. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and learn more about your brilliant services there at BAPAM. And I hope lots of listeners will be more aware of the things that they can get do to get involved and get some help if they need it. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining me on the Vocal Freedom Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll move into your day with a bit more vocal freedom, feeling that you can express using your voice and let the world hear what you have to say. Visit colchestervoiceacademy.com forward slash podcast. Sign up to be kept informed as new episodes are published and consider joining our online community. Membership to this will allow you to post questions to our guests, 
link you to show notes, social media links, and entitle you to exclusive offers from our guests. See you next time.